Welcome to Best Practice, a show where we interview leaders in the building industry to unpack the tools, strategies, and tactics they use to run great organizations. Today, we're very excited to be joined by Sarah Laporgolo um, and Oliver Link of Seldorf Architects about how to build collaborative practices. Sarah is a partner at Seldorf Architects with three decades of professional experience and has been with the firm for over 20 years. She has worked on many of the firm's major projects, including large scale new construction and cultural facilities. Ms. Lepergolo is currently partner in charge for the expansion and renovation of the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego, and the expansion and enhancement of the Frick Collection. Additionally, she has significant experience with ground up construction, having served as partner in charge on large scale projects such as the Sunset Park Material Recovery Facility in Brooklyn and 211th Avenue, a 19-story residential condominium in New York City. Um, Sarah has also received a, a Bachelor of Architecture degree from Syracuse University and has studied and worked in England, Italy, and Japan. She is a fellow of the New of American Institute of Architects, treasurer of the board of Open House New York, a really amazing uh, program, and sits on the advisory board of Syracuse University's School of Architecture. Oliver Link is an associate partner at Seldorf Architects with 20 years experience working on architecture projects in South Africa, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, Brazil, and across the United States. His portfolio includes a large variety of projects with emphasis on museum and gallery design, as well as retail and high-end residential design for internationally known apparel brands and high-profile residential clients. Since joining Seldorf Architects in 2011, he has managed many of the firm's museum and art-related projects, including the Glass Museum, Le Stanze, Del Vetro in Venice, galleries for Michael Werner Gallery, and Gagosian in London and New York, as well as Christie's Galleries in Paris. He is currently the project manager on the expansion and enhancement project of the Frick Collection in New York. And with that, thank you very much for joining us today, Sarah and Oliver. Thank you again, Chris, for joining uh, us as well. Thanks for having well, us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. It's uh, really a wonderful series that you do. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. that. Yeah, thanks. Super excited. So I think to start off with, we can just kind of... Uh, start off with just thinking of uh, just add the question on what is your perspective on practice? You know, it has various definitions people use, but for you, and maybe we can start off with Sarah, like what is your perspective on practice? Uh, that you have to keep doing it. Practice, practice, practice. Um, it's, you know, it's a profession that um, we're learning never really stops. Right. Um, but, but joking aside, I think, um, you know, it's evolving. Um, we, we still are, are building things um, by hand, right, uh, essentially. Um, and so um, it, it's, it's a lot of what has existed for so long, but also new, new things ahead of us and, and new ways of working together. And, and obviously with technology and, and the issues around um, that face our world with climate change. So I think all of that is, you know, adds to, to what, what is ahead of us and what we're currently dealing with, but always kind of their central uh, characteristics of the R building architecture and, and space for people to inhabit. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, I mean, I think the process of practice and the process of architecture takes a lot of time. It can generally be an inefficient process just by the nature of having to deal with a lot of moving parts. Um, it, you know, you're, you're never really working in an isolated environment. And so I think the, the sort of how, how one continuously wants to make the process of, of working in a practice as efficient as possible. And I think also a lot of our practice is, is sort of on re, is research based. And as Sarah said, that's often learning new things on every project. And I think that's also why the sort of diversity of our portfolio gives us um, new and interesting projects all the time. So yeah. we're never sort of shoehorned. We're always learning, as Sarah says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah, and you know, just that what you said, Oliver, about um, always trying to find efficient ways to do things and, and various parts of our profession keeping up with and advancing and how fast the computers are versus how fast something can actually really get built. Um, there's always these competing competing things going going at uh, get going at us. 
What's the working dialogue between the two of you at Seldorf? Are you working closely on any projects or on any initiatives um, as leaders in the firm? Yes, so, so yeah, actually, um, Sarah and I work together on the Frick Museum expansion. I, I was and am still the project manager. Um, since then, I have become a design partner. Um, Sarah is is a design partner on that project, but we we collaborate um, very regularly on that project. But but even outside of our projects, we um, I think we I rely a lot on on Sarah's um, sort of camaraderie and just bouncing things off her all the time. So we we have a I mean you know, we have a relationship outside of our our projects um, as well that that I think is contributing to to my growth but also to the practice um in, in a, as a whole yeah i think uh that's right oliver I, I and i value oliver's expertise on many things and his uh unbelievable project management skills that um we really uh, are true value to the firm and also learn you know such a great uh mentor to a lot of um people in the office to 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 kind of help with all of those skills that aren't readily learned in school necessarily. So um. love to hear a little bit more about what what those excellent skills are uh, from Oliver and what what you're talking about with the rest of the team to try to okay. mentor some of those some of those great approaches. Um, so um, I guess in the project management role, um, which you know I still have, as I said, and but have also sort of like moved on from. Um, I, you know, I hope that other project managers have seen me as a mentor. I, I, I joined Seldorf 10 years ago um, as a project manager and um, found just the sort of setup of the firm was immensely supportive um, in, in just sort of that role and, and, and how I could practice and be an efficient project manager was 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 incredible just moving from one firm to to this particular firm the previous firm was a much smaller firm and it didn't have in a way a sort of system set up or a hierarchy set up that is we have set up here but i say hierarchy not just more about you know who's at different tiers but more about the support system of it because mm -hmm. i think you know one can always go I, like I have and gone always to Sarah for support, but I can also go to other project managers and so on and so forth. Um, I think working as a project manager um, in our office is a very unique role. Yeah. At least we see it that way. Um, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not a small firm. We're, you know, a firm of 70 um, staff members and um, our project management role is it, it includes looking, you know, at schedules, budgets, spreadsheets, keeping things in check. But the project managers are really also involved in the design and working closely with design partners and Annabelle to, to, to sort of move along, you know, move along this process that I said earlier is sort of takes a lot of time and takes an entire village and a, and a, and a support system to keep moving. Um, so, so I think that's, you know, I sort of pride myself in my project management skills as, as being um, always as efficient as possible and looking for honing in on the specifics and trying to move things forward and always sort of pushing the noise aside because there's just so much that goes on in, in our profession and in our, you know, on, on all projects and in our environment that one just needs to sort of keep things moving forward and, and be as efficient as possible. So yeah, I think I think an aspect of that is um, kind of a mantra of closing the loop, meaning uh, there's so much information that, you know, so much, so many details that uh, go into making a building or seeing a project through and that sort of keeping your eye on the ball and, and making sure that when something begins, a conversation begins, you're able to to completely put put a put a loop on it and, and finish it off. And I think that's really, um, you know, very, very important to getting things done and built. And, and I think that that's the role of the project manager as well. All of us, all of our roles, but really in particular, um, you know, making sure that we have closure. 
Yeah, I wonder, Oliver, if you would resonate with this um, this uh, way of operating or project managing that uh, Zoe Starr from um, from DSR brought up in our last conversation, which had to do around like there's always this thing that you have to know what to push off, like when a decision needs to be made today versus when it needs to be made later, and like how much you know, even to know like how much time do you have in a sense to be able to make that decision? Um, is that part of your own process too for like thinking about uh, from, from a project management perspective or do you have other sort of maybe like uh, rules of thumb that you use that help you in a given moment be able to say, okay, this is not appropriate for now or like this is, you know, maybe right. you can walk us all through that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, prioritization is obviously key. And, um, you know, I, when, I, when I sort of was a younger project manager, I sort of developed systems of lists and, and, and was able to sort of keep track of things in, in that way. Um, and, but there is always, the, as you say, the short-term responses and the long-term uh, responses. And the key is to sort of identify um, what can be on what track in 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 a, in a sense um you know i um i you know getting into a system of meeting with one's teams regularly internally um with design partners with annabelle but 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 with the team and 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 sort of checking in as much as possible and communicating as much as possible i think is key just to make sure nobody is um there <laughs> confused about the priorities. I think that's key is this just making sure that and 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 then I you know I want to add it's it's one has to be very careful that there is no micromanaging involved because you don't want to be sort of hovering over someone so that they're not yeah. feeling that they can work in a, in a sort of free environment and not be sort of watched on all yeah. the time. But I think uh, setting clear expectations, right, Oliver, that's really what that's about right. is with your team. If, you, if your expectations are clear, um, then you just have more room for everyone to be successful because they understand, you know, what, what their role is, what their job is to do in the, any given moment. Sarah, you have, um, you have this experience running your own office before you join Seldorf, um, and when you join Seldorf, it was only 25, and now it's in the 70s. Um, what if you, in that time from you having returned to a larger practice, um, what what new lessons might you fold have folded in in retrospect uh, to your old practice? Because a, a lot of listeners are in a smaller scale than 70. There may be between um, five to 30 around that. So um, we always like to highlight what larger practices are discovering and try to um, bring them to a smaller scale. Smaller, yeah. So to clarify, I actually started at Seldorf in 1994 when we were five people. Um, and after a, a number of years, I left and started my own practice and did that for about five years. Um, and then came back to the firm. And when I came back, you know, I left when we were five, I came back, we were about 20, 25. Um, and uh, what are the lessons I learned from a small firm to bring to a large firm? I think it's, it's uh, certain systems that you, as a, a smaller company that you have to put in place to get things done. Uh, obviously you bring that with you. Um, I think what a larger firm brings is, you know, more resources, right? And I think it's identi you know, being able to identify when do we need to shift gears? When do we need to bring that person on board now that, you know, will really unlock um, easier ways for us to do work, right? So I think the, the good thing about having a small, your own firm and then going to a larger firm is that you, you, you really know how to, how you have to get things done. So you you understand that and you understand that from the People that are, are working at every level because you're you're kind of doing everything when it's your own small firm, right? So you you bring an understanding back, I think, to the to the larger structure. Um, but there's a lot there's a lot as you know you know how you scale from 25 to then you know we grew very organically and slowly in in this office. So so there wasn't like a gigantic project that suddenly we increased overnight. It was a very kind of slow and steady and methodical growth 
And I think those at that point, um, you really try to at each of these inflections understand like, okay, what do we need here right now? Like what new kind of staff member do we need to kind of unlock us to be able to go on to the next step in, in, the, in the practice in the firm? Um, and, you know, when we were five people, there was no hierarchy. There was Annabelle and there was all of us working on our individual projects. But as a firm gets larger, right, you have to start to put systems in place and, and to be able for everyone to feel kind of safe and protected in their, in their roles that they have backup. Um, so I probably answered multiple questions in there, but. Uh. <laughs> I'm curious then from, uh, from both of your experiences, what what kind of shifts have you seen while you've been at, at, at Seldorf? And going back to maybe your point, Sarah, about who is that person that we need to hire that kind of unlocks, maybe you can unpack a little bit of like the sure. type of role that was necessary at what inflection point. Right. So um, we didn't really have an HR person for a long time, right? It wasn't necessary. Uh, Annabelle and I were doing proposals ourselves, negotiating and all that. And there became a moment where like, we need someone. <laughs> we need someone that can handle the proposals. We need someone that can um, maybe do more HR for us. And we we're like, we're never ever gonna find that person uh, under one hat. You know, we're, we're, it's just impossible. Um, but we did, we found, we found him, Bill. Bill Bigelow, wherever you are out there. Uh, he, and he he was really instrumental in helping us kind of go to the next level of where we could kind of take on a little bit larger projects at that time. And um, uh, yeah, so that we could, you know, our, our talents could be focused more on other things and people that could kind of focus on, on proposals and, and uh, other things could, could do their work. I mean, it make, you know, it makes total sense. That, that that would be necessary after a while. Yeah, and to Sarah's point also growing, growing organically. I mean, um, I joined the firm when I, it was about just under 40 people and now we're 65, 70. You know, our interviewing process is, we spend a lot of time on the interviewing process because, you know, we feel creating the right team and, you know, we have the most amazing, fantastic group of people um, is, is really key as opposed to, you know, adding five, 10 people for a specific project and so on and so forth. That's just really not how we, right. we like to operate. So we spend a lot of time on the interview process and strategically talking about what level of person do we need at this point? What level of person do we want to hire that could then grow into X, Y, Z? Do we want to not hire at that level because that person can grow from within? Um, that's always part of our um, our strategy then it might take a little longer at the beginning but it pays off ultimately um i think yeah we we have people that have been with the firm for many many years which is you know really fantastic and i think it speaks to what oliver is saying is that we don't ever just the way in which we grew slowly we don't hire like that and because we want to be sure that the person that's coming is somebody that will will stick around and really because it just enriches the your experience the more you there's a lot to learn in architecture so the more you can um st stick in one place and, and really take in what there is to learn and, and and with from your colleagues from the projects you're on it really is beneficial to the architect but also to the, the firm as a whole and i've actually you know, heard Sorry. Oh, go ahead, Oliver. No, I was just going to continue on that and, you know, just say that uh, having, you know, not had my own practice, but worked first and foremost in firms of four people, sometimes two people, you know, that all rounded experience uh, um, is obviously key, even as you grow then to a project manager's levels and beyond, because you understand, obviously, as Sarah said, all those complexities of the project. I think the key is that if someone has not had that same path, which many people haven't is to just really understand and identify where they're coming from. And I think that's as a project manager is often a challenge or not a challenge, but it's a challenge and an opportunity, I would say, but something one should keep in mind is, you know, who's joining this team now, who's in this meeting. Okay. You know, just remembering where, not remembering everyone's resume off the top of your head, but just sort of contextualizing that so that 
that person can can get the right responses and growth w w within the firm, um, I think is key as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interestingly, we've heard um, from other firms a similar approach to hiring where it's actually disconnected from new projects in the firm. And so I'm curious how you, how do you think plan when to hire or know when to hire when it is maybe not tied to the thing that you might expect it to be tied to so like you're adding like this um you're adding to the infrastructure of the team right. but mm -hmm. not necessarily connected to new opportunities in the firm so i sarah should i go in okay <laughs> i mean in the background i will say we are excel spreadsheet geeks so we have we keep, we look at staffing on a weekly basis. All the project managers meet. We assign staff, most staff on similar projects week by week. It changes with deadlines, things move around. And um, that same chart plugs into a bigger chart that um, looks ahead three months or six months. And it, and, it, and it actually lists all the staff and the projects that they're on, but it also sort of tallies up the overall staff within each category. And then we look at that strategically. So then if a project comes along, you know, we, we know we're short this or short that or short that. And, but it's not just one project, you know, it's always yeah. looking back, going back to that mega chart that I'm explaining yeah. um, and just looking at it from a, on the bigger picture. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's almost like a heat map in that, right, with that right. chart, it's sort of like we asked everyone to to put in what they need, and that I know that sounds a bit of a wish right, list, it's, right? It's, it's more of a wish list, not like so abstract, like I want to, you know, ten people on my team, but more what what is it that they really need, and so that way we get a read of like, okay, this is where we're really short, and that prompts us to obviously look for people, but it also promise, prompts us to kind of re-examine the teams. Do we have the right people? Can we move this person here and there? Um, it's exhaustive process, uh, <laughs> right? Um, but it, it, you know, it, it's worked out so far. We'll, 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 we'll have to keep it going. And it's also a tool that we use to look at um, staff members and see what types of projects and work they've been doing if they've been on the same type of typology for a year, or if they've you know, been doing, let's say renderings for a year, it's time, which typically we don't have. It's time to move them into a, on a CA project where they can really get more experience on, in construction and so on and so forth. So it's that same game with the same you know, list of staff and projects, but also addressing that because we want everyone to get well-rounded. Yeah. Just as we have a variety of different typologies, it's the same way. We don't really want to have departments, if you will, of like people that just do residential or just, we just feel like it makes a better architect, a more well-rounded architect to have varying experiences of, of different typologies and different clients. I, I really appreciate that this is unique. I, we haven't heard that, that kind of practice before of, of looking at the need that people are requesting and likely it's through it's not even like a, i need a person but uh, we have a challenge with this or it's like thematic likely mm -hmm. probably where the challenges are bucketed right yes but that you're looking at those th themes consistently to then figure out how to remove or lower the friction that those that those uh things uh present yes. yeah and I, th I think that's a really amazing way to look at uh, resourcing that's so what, what I really appreciate it from 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 that perspective is that it because it's tied to themes you know it's not you know uh, oftentimes you might hear that like uh, how people are talked about sort of is like staff or like a resource or something right it's almost a utility what you're <laughs> by this practice what you're saying is actually no it's not the utility we're looking it's like we need people with special sets of skills that that can help us organizationally become more, much more effective. But mm -hmm. it's more of a one plus one equals three approach as opposed to like, hey, I just need bodies. Right. <laughs> right. This time. That, that's and, absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, no question with that, but that's really, uh, really commendable. I feel like this is definitely one of those like takeaways for everybody that's listening. You should write that one down because it, it's, it's again, looking at the entire firm as a, as a system of challenges that it's trying to resolve in real time. Some of it, it can predict, some of it, it can't, but find, but it's more about finding the people that can help answer those questions as they come up so that the whole team is learning almost like a hive mind from that practice, which yeah. is really awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, w- with that kind of wisdom that the team has, that it's clearly there embedded. I'm curious, like what other, um, you know, do you have other ways in which you've made, you've been able to make like, let's say things like collaboration really successful within teams like how do you have a similar lens by which to look at how teams are operating not at the holistic level of the whole firm but just more within projects um yeah loosely i mean i think one thing i would say is that we begin our process very small with a small group right even though it may be a large you know ultimately a large project we 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 start small start start to really identify what is the problem, what is, what, what are we after, uh, wh- you know, what is it that we want out of this project, right? And I think that, that, and then as it formulates, then the team can expand. And I think that that helps to mitigate maybe frustration and that you're not, because there, there's a lot of iteration that happens. And um, so to, to really kind of identify what that, what that, what the project is. It doesn't mean it can't change. It doesn't mean people bring their own intelligence and things morph and and because of course that happens. But it's really setting out the the thesis, if you will, starts small and then and then the team absorbed. I, I don't know if I I think a lot of times you get a big project, like all hands on deck. I, I we, we don't oper, operate that way. Well, Obviously, that's just it gets that's filled just... out. But yeah, and that just sort of says inefficiency to me. Like, you're right, like start small, start very concentrated, need what you need, take what you need. And and because, you know, because it's an iterative process, it builds up, it builds up, it builds up, right? So it's, the teams get bigger as the teams need to grow and as the project gets more com- complex and as we move into the next round or the phases of the project, um, you know, we're a very collaborative um, office. Annabelle is, you know, the design lead on all of our projects. Um, we, you know, the design partners work very closely with her on developing designs, but so do the project managers and the teams. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, because it being so research-based, when you have um, when you have these meetings or these design moments or sessions, you want to make sure, you know, they, they're very there may be one hour or two hours that week for that project for everyone to be around the table. And so you want to make sure that the research is done and and brought to the table in the most sort of direct and efficient way so that we have the tools to start designing and moving moving exactly. the project forward. What's nice about that is that you give someone on the team, be it at the architectural design level, you give them the power of the sort of research, the knowledge, right? So they go away, they spend time doing research. They're the ones now that know more about the site or the zoning or the this than we do, right? And so they come, they present that. And and I just feel like- they Ownership. Just, they have ownership, ownership over that, that aspect, that, which is very, very important. Exactly, exactly. Um, that's fascinating. What, what about- on the side of the client side, like as you're working as a small group in the earliest stages, and then as that group is growing, um, on sort of the client slash end user side of this, how are you, and I'm trying to also piece together the way you're thinking about noise, Oliver, sort of like, and being strategic about when information is coming in or when feedback is going out. Uh, how do you, how do you think about that from an external lens? I mean, ultimately the client is who gives us projects and who give us work and who pay the bills, right? So, but I think part of our process is also to, our collaborative process is to say that the client is yet another team member in a way, right? And so we we, um, 
try to educate them about the process as much as possible so that they are part of the process. And um, obviously there are expectations, there are schedules, and we try to sort of, we, we stick to those, but we try to measure those and give, you know, heads up where we are and, and keep, keep clients as looped in um, as possible with updates um, beyond the regular meetings and, and, and meeting minutes and so on and so forth. Um, but we, our design comes out of this process, right? It's not somebody sitting in a corner in a dark room and just <laughs> whipping out a design. It's, it's really um, this, this collaborative process within our office, with us and our client and with the consultants and any other members of, that are part of the design team. Yeah, um, I, I would add, Oliver, that I think that um, in a way that the, obviously the client is looking for leadership from us, right? That's, that's very, very important. But I think that the client sometimes knows more than we know, right? In the beginning right. anyway, they know what they want. And I think the careful listening um, is part of that you know, collaboration, really hearing, hearing what, what it is, um, but taking that and bringing forth something that, that it was unexpected to them or something that came out of real, real thought and study. Um, and just, you know, I, I always say that architecture is the most collaborative of professions in the sense that we can't do any of what we do without people and teams, right? We can't, we can't, we need builders, we need engineers, we need our, our client, um, we need our colleagues, obviously. So, so sometimes I think people think of architecture as the lone person in the corner, as Oliver said, working away. <laughs> um, but, but we all know, right, that it, it's, a, it's a much more um, necessary, you know, group of people around you all the time. Um, and I think that's what's what's great about it. It's great. It's fantastic to be on site with with a contractor and working things out um, that you weren't expecting to. Um, of course, always there's there can be tension, but it, oftentimes we found that it's an amazing process working with the builder, um, and and what what you can learn from from that. Um. How would you say the collaborative nature of, of the, the firm uh, impacts the culture of, of the firm? Do you find that, I mean, there's some, there's, there's some proof points there, like the, the, the tenure of people in the firm is probably a good indication that like the collaborative nature is something um, that people are really uh, appreciative, but do you find other ways in which you get feedback from your own employees as to like, you know, I mean, I would imagine that having that responsibility of doing the research for a new project coming in is a really amazing opportunity for someone, um, you know, potentially a more junior position to be able to have that ownership and that authority. I mean, is, is it very explicit? Maybe that's another way to frame the question. Is it, do you find that the culture is explicit in some sense or does it emerge organically from like the collaborative nature of the firm? I think it's not explicit. I don't know, Oliver. What I, would you I agree. I agree. I don't think it's explicit. I think it comes out of the nature of the way learning to work together in, in this way. I mean, maybe, maybe it might seem like because the teams start out small that there there isn't you know like collaborations per se from the start. But I I, I think that it really is for the benefit of everyone to kind of you know grow the team as we as we grow in the project. Um, so uh, it's not explicit, but I think I think that that you know everyone taking ownership of their what they do, bringing their intelligence to the table is what we want. Um, I always say it's my business to make you a good architect. So there's I don't want to I'm not going to step in your way. I want you to do what you can do, um, and allow that you know allow that to to foster that so that no one feels like they're held back. Um, What's holding you back is just, just experience, just getting in there and learning more and more. Um, well, I think that's what's key, the word experience. And, and because I, I, I sort of go into a collaborative process or meeting knowing I only know what I know, right? But somebody, no matter what level it is, somebody knows more than I do about this particular topic. And, and, and acknowledging that and then letting that person lead that particular item, whatever it may be, or aspect of a project, I think 
one has to make the room for that because if you don't, then there's no collaboration. Right. And at, at the same time, what you bring from not being in the, the total leads, what leadership can bring is just a little bit of perspective, like step right. it being able to step out and say, oh, well, what about this? And um, and so I, I that that that's I think a nice a nice thing. It's not that it's necessarily a top down thing in in that way, but more about like having a like the perspective to see see something in a different angle after you've been digging in deeply. On yeah, and what one does will what one actually does with that information and that knowledge, right? That's kind of our job in a way. Like, what do we yeah. do? You, you you've told me this now. What am I going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? So right. that we can. How do we take it to the step. next? Exactly. Step. exactly. Yeah. And and including everyone in that conversation, I think is most fruitful. <clears throat> yeah. Do you know from the um, maybe because it's so research based and it seems like there's a very iterative way in which it goes about each 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 new project has a similar, let's say, intentional way of starting and evolving, and maybe mapped over with like Seldorf's unique take on solutions for a project that is very research driven, which means that the the outcome might never be, uh, you know, you might not have the idea of the outcome of beforehand, right? Right. Do you know already or have anticipate where in the process? you expect the most uncertainty as an example um you know in the conversation with uh with the dsr team last week um for them the ca process is a very it's almost like where almost everything gets like a lot of places uh, items get resolved um in ca and so for them they've strategically have but even budgeted um to account for the ambiguity, the, all the resolution that happens at the end, they try as much to kind of bring that forward. But f uh, f um, in, in, in Seldorf's instance, do you have that kind of already mapped out? Like, is there a place in the project timeline where you anticipate, okay, this is where the most uncertainty is after we cross this, everything else is pretty like we, we, we have, we have way more clarity and can be done pretty, uh, not streamlined, but yeah, you understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I tend it's to go with our colleagues. <laughs> um, I, you know, I think, um, yes, would it be great if everything is buttoned up at the end of CDs and we just disappear? <laughs> but that's just not the reality. And I think what we're finding is schedule pressures are making us to come, making us come up with new ways of where can we accelerate. And so you're seeing on more and more projects that there's pre-construction, CMs are, are uh, construction managers are invited into the design process sooner, especially on larger institutional development pro developer projects. Their knowledge base um, comes in sooner into the process, into the design process. Obviously, we try the drawings. Yes, we try and manage it as much as possible. We don't want yeah. them interfering. But at the same time, we've found over the years, for example, with millwork design, you know, we 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 would draw millwork details almost to the level that someone could just take it and run and build it, right? Which is great, but at the same time, there's an entire shop drawing process, which adds another few months to the project. And you do yet that whole thing over again, and you mm. find out that some of what you drew is really not that material is not available, or that material will take six months to come from Japan, or it's a, whatever it is, it's suddenly, had I known that six months ago, right? That would have been good. So, so I think, we are finding that I, I, I'm seeing that we have to adjust our fees along the, the, the projects a little bit more and, and make sure that we have um, enough you know, in the end, enough in the end yeah. and that we yeah. can stay involved and we have to stay involved. And I think builders are getting more and more sophisticated as well. They, you know, they're now getting involved through the BIM process. And, and as I said, this pre-construction process much earlier on. So um, when is the most uncertainty? I would say at the beginning maybe, but then- Yeah, I would say, I, that's what I was gonna <laughs> Especially, with... yeah, especially because we don't jump to like some what? clarity right away, you know? I think that's right. I don't think that, I don't, I think that we don't necessarily come to a project with a preconceived notion. Sometimes that happens. But um, I think it really comes out of learning what the 
you know, what is the site, the importance of the context, the importance of who this client is. So things have to get teased out. And, 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 uh, and I, so there, there can be a, some ups and downs during schematic design in terms of, you know, iterations and, and uncertainty. But, you know, that, that's par part, of the, part of the process and, and, you know, depends on the client, depends on the site, the complexities of the site. Sometimes when we go to landmarks, uh, there's iterations around landmarks that could really hold things up. Um, uh, so yeah, I think the the, uh, the beginning and the end is uh, <laughs> right. where where there's issues, right? Right. Usually. In light of, because every project has its own world of schedule and time, um, but we live in this calendar universe. <laughs> How do you? Um, how do you like recognize systems that are repeating on a weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis? It's sort of a question about like, what is your typical work week, month, quarter look like in both of your roles? Oh my gosh, jammed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's- Zoom it's, it's, made it, Zoom-, the Zoom I, I was world, just gonna go there. Okay, the Zoom sorry. Zoom world made it quite, uh, sorry, Oliver, but- quite interesting because no one had to commute anymore, right? So it was like every every calendar slot was filled and it would be like, oh my God, I haven't eaten today. Oh, did I even go to the bathroom? You know, just uh, that kind of craziness. So you in a way had to be very intentional of like sometimes um, I would, uh, where I was staying sometime during the pandemic was two floors. And sometimes I would be like intentionally forget like, okay, I'll go get that later because at least it will make me get up from my desk and walk down the steps and get some exercise. Like, I don't have to think about bringing everything upstairs all at once. So, so kind of crazy, crazy little things to, to, to sort of manage those, those intense days. And so now it's back to like, oh, we need to book a half hour to get there and right. a half hour to get back. So, so it changes, changes things. But I mean, generally, oh, my, you know, our calendars, as you said, it's not, it's a calendar year, but it's not because it relates to projects and project schedules, right? So you're always thinking in terms of your world is sort of, you have some projects where it's like this one year, one year schedule. And then the Frick, for example, is sort of a six year schedule. So you're, you're in a way always sort of adjusting yourself when you go to this meeting for this project and this meeting for that project, because you have to adjust really it's, it's sort of anticipated completion, if that makes any sense. Um, so, so, I mean, just to, I mean, on a weekly basis, as, yeah, as Sarah said, I mean, we try and be as, as efficient as possible with, with meetings, but the meetings are layers of meetings, internal meetings, internal meetings with your teams, internal meetings with the design partner and Annabelle, and then previews of presentations and then the presentation. So yeah, and we can fill up very quickly. I mean, to the point that you start that I put things in my calendar just to block out time to sort of put pencil to paper and sketch quietly. <laughs> I thought you were going to ask a question about emails. Oh, well, <laughs> horrible emails are. Oh, well, um, that could be a actually, whole series, right? <laughs> yeah, we just, we also got an audience question about how the firm has dealt with hybrid work. So maybe you could speak a little bit more to that in terms of email ex exchange, um, Zoom, having to reconsider the logistics of meetings now, whereas you know in the past you didn't really have to. I, I think um, what I found to be most challenging, and I would think a lot of people found that, was the the multiple forms of communication that really intensified. So because we were all remote in the beginning, we were put in place a Teams chat thing. So there's Teams going on <laughs> chatting. There's, you're on your Zoom call. There's people texting you. There's emails coming in. Um, and that kind of multi-layer is not, it's not good for you. <laughs> it's not good for the brain. And I, I think that maybe the, the more, the older staff is used to having to communicate all day long, but I think it was probably challenging for people who were, you know, excited to sit at their desk and get through a drawing and all of a sudden they're getting like pinged all over the place. And I, I think that uh, is, is an adjustment. I mean, it's, it's, it's an adjustment for everyone. It's not, 
I, I don't like it. But, but even for if you spend your day like really focused on something, it's really hard to, to concentrate when, when all that communication is gone. But we got through it. We were really efficient and managed and blocked out team meetings. Um, and really, in a way, it became quite nice to work with teams. Annabelle was in, in you know, all of these weekly meetings. And, and it was just it was great for the younger staff to work with her one-on-one um, -on -one or with, uh, us in a group. So it, it, it provided some really nice, nice moments together, I think. I mean, as far as hybrid goes, I think we're still learning, right, Sarah? We're not. Yeah, we're still, yeah, we're still there. Uh, we're still in our. We're still hybrid. <laughs> we're hybrid, right. And we're still trying to figure out what is the best way forward. Um, I think everyone is. Recognizing right. that they will, it is a hybrid world so in right. some degree. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I was only going to. Uh, kind of add to that too about um, communication at, at Monograph we're fully remote and um, we weren't initially going to do that uh, it was only after the, after the pandemic where it kind of opened up that ability for us to strategically now how, be able to hire team members from anywhere um, and that I, I completely resonate with this idea of like all the constant stream of communication it's almost never never off um, and you have to kind of build in, like, even in your calendar, you have to kind of like block out time for yeah. moments in which like, it's just heads down time. And there's it's like a, uh, this uh, uh, Paul Graham, who's well known in this in sort of the startup community has an, uh, uh, an essay he wrote a while back called, uh, what is it, uh, makers versus uh, manager schedules. And basically, you have to block out your calendar. So in the morning, you're have, it's like makers time versus mm -hmm. manager time is in the afternoon. And that's when you can be more responsive to questions people will ask you, or, you know, it's because in engineering terms and software engineering, this whole idea, and it's actually very applicable in, in creative practices too, is the idea of being in flow. Are you mm -hmm. like in a flow state, which is what you know, it, you know, when you're in it, because you're just in that drawing, like listening to music and like just it's just you're yeah. in it right that's right. great so, i love that and so it's figuring out ways to maximize for that because this the world of software engineering has figured out that if you have it's not just the time on your calendar it's the, the ramp up time to be in that flow state for that meeting so mm -hmm. even if you have a meeting it's probably better for you to, uh, to like not have a meeting 15 minutes before that meeting so that you have time to prepare mentally for the amount of depth you need to be in um and th that, that's like a really fascinating way of looking at uh, how to kind of take control back over your mm -hmm. calendar in some sense. Right. We use other methods to like, um, you know, if it's, if, the, if it's not an immediate answer that you need and it's information that you're trying to communicate, then record it using a tool called Loom and mm -hmm. send it via Slack, which is what we use, right? And so that allows for the person receiving it to then view it on their time when it's most appropriate to then respond in detail or something or their own loom backwards and we have found asynchronous communication to be something that we really highly leverage uh here at monograph to uh improve what we're talking about now which is uh yeah really really important yeah that's great yeah i'm always so interested in how other people are doing things because I, I find it's it's changing our brains right the way this this constant communication is um, boom. Okay, I'll check it out. <laughs> we have another question from the community. Um, it's a, one of the favorites from the community, which is, what do you least like about practice or the building industry? <sighs> <laughs> cut deep, cut steep. <laughs> well, I think when um, Oliver was talking about kind of your day and how to organize your week and so on and, and like your team meetings and so on. The thing that he didn't mention is when all of a sudden there's, um, uh, you know, uh, something that has to be attended to immediately. Uh, something happened on site, something happened that was misunderstanding. Um, and so that is not fun ever, like dealing with a problem at a construction site um, is is always really stressful. Um, you know, you're you're dealing with lots of money all the time um, with, with construction and and your clients' money, and so it's 
So being very cognizant of that and, and the issues and things that can go wrong is just the most stressful part, I think, of our jobs. Um, and so uh, that is my least favorite, dealing with those things. They come up and they have to be dealt with, but it's not fun. And I think the other part is the closeout of a project. Sometimes it, it's True. nice and closed out and buttoned up, but other times you're on it for a few more months and it's just, your teams like, have moved so on. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but yeah. <laughs> Questions are top of mind for you right now at Seldorf. Um, I think for us and probably lots of people in the profession is, is how we truly expand diversity in, in, the, in the profession. Um, so we're, you know, we're always talking about it. We're always struggling and trying. And, and um, I mean, it may be what everybody else is saying too, but it, it is true. It is top of mind and how we can, can make this a more equitable profession. Um, and it starts, you know, starts with us and it, it also starts well beyond, uh, well before high school and college. And I, I think that, you know, we're talking about ways in which we can, you know, have an impact um, in that way very early on, um, you know, getting involved in, in, in middle school programs uh, where we can, where we can really, you know, have role models for people that never imagined being in the profession. That's top of mind for me. Yeah, and I think we're finding it's more about us not advertising, but sort of making sure we are getting that we are known in a much broader population, right? Than or, 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 or schools or you know high schools and so on. It's it's more it's the flip side really. It's like how do we how do how do people get to know about architecture as a profession and how do they get to know about us? Um, so I think that's one of our efforts is to do workshops, presentations to to schools. We've we've we did one series last year with um, City Tech and um, we did a sort of workshop program. I think it was a four series program. And then whoever attended the workshop was then allowed to submit a um, application. application for summer internship. And then we selected two um, interns from that out of that workshop. Um, so yeah, that's always on our mind and always a sort of topic of conversation we you know we we try to have these sort of regular forums where we can talk about um equity and diversity and inclusion um you know and also include sort of either text or an article or something that then we can or film even that we can then um talk as a group we have to restart our film club we had a Yes. Our EDI film club going, which was very nice. We have to get the next movie on, on the boards. Another audience question here. Could you please share any words of advice for people who recently entered a practice and ways of finding ownership of projects when things are still new and daunting? So I think it's kind of a question about um, being new to practice and how to find ownership while dealing with your own uncertainty about what you're capable of um, and where you can have uh, make a contribution despite your uh, being new to the to practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think the advice I would give is to be extremely curious and ask lots of questions. Um, do you do as much research as you can? Um, don't hide behind you know, the fear of not knowing something, turn, turn that around and, and really dig in and, and, and be that researcher, find out what you need to know. Um, it, it doesn't help anyone to, to shy away. And if you, if you get feedback that you're not happy with, I think it's also asking like, like, you know, don't, don't just, you know, change my drawing, but actually explain to me what, what I could have done better. And, you know, it, asking for that kind of feedback, I think is important. Yeah, I think realizing that it's this two-way street, right? Is that you you you're taking ownership of something, but you 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 don't want to sort of just dead end it. You want to invite people into the conversation, and that right. allows you to take something away from that process as well. Yeah. 
Well, I think we're, we're almost at time. So I'll kind of wrap it up with our favorite question here at Monograph. And um, that is, what is the kindest or nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? I could start off with you, Sarah. Oh, okay. Um, along the lines of the last question about, you know, being young in a firm, um, I, I think about one of my first jobs in Boston at Elkis Manfredi where um, the, the, my project manager was just an extremely generous, uh, incredible role model. Um, and um, she didn't know she was doing it as a kindness, but she, she went and had a baby. And, and by her having the baby, it really like allowed me to, to, to take over in a ways that I wouldn't normally have done at that, that age. But uh, she was also very trustworthy. Um, and then on a personal level, I'll just say that my, uh, my youngest brother passed away in 2011 from ALS and the kindness that I saw in all my friends and colleagues and from, from many years prior and everything was really, to me, the, the most meaningful thing that I've experienced. Yeah, I think for me, um, there were, it's really not one person in particular, although I do wanna, you know, call out some people in specific, but it, always along the way of my career, I think just thinking of, uh, Adel, uh, you know, in particular women who have given me <laughs> opportunities. Uh, my first job in New York was for a small firm uh, run by a, a woman on, on woman owned business um, and where I really was given the sort of opportunity to just take on a project. I mean, I was out of school for a year uh, or not even a year and, and she entrusted me with projects. Um, and, and then just sort of along, along the way, um, it's sort of in my next profession, I remember working with one of the vice presidents and she was very inspirational to me as far as the balance of project management and leadership, but also making sure that one is always engaging and collaborating with people and not just standing as a leader in this sort of mm -hmm. um, undemocratic way. And um, yeah, I mean, and then down to my personal life, uh, you know, I lost my mother at an early age and there was also a woman there who she took the train and got on a bus and brought, you know, cooked meals for us, you know. Um, so I just remember that as a real act of kindness as well. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, yeah, we always like to kind of take stock of the fact that, you know, there's the business side of things, but then there's also the really human reality of it and really appreciate those, those stories. And that's, um, that's a great question, by the way. Yeah, so, it is. <laughs> very Thank thought, you. very yeah. thought provoking. One thinks about, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, it brings you um, back. Yeah. yeah, it's good. It's a, yeah, it's, it's been a really, uh, it's been amazing to see kind of the, the, the breadth of different answers and they kind of all come back to just like empathy and kindness in a way that's, um, that's invigorating. I mean, it just, it kind of brings also a positive light to, the profession too, um, which we very much enjoy. Um, well, with, with that, I guess um, I will we'll kind of uh, wrap up with just a quick blurb about Monograph, uh, your sponsors for this uh, webinar. Um, Monograph is designed for architects by architects. About, I don't know how many, maybe 40% of us have some relationship with architecture in the firm. Um, hundreds of firms are using Monograph to visually manage their practice operations streamline their repetitive processes and empower their team to grow sustainably. In fact, 85% of monograph re reviews say easy, simple, and intuitive. Um, very rare within project management tools if you are accustomed to the ones that have been in the industry for a while. Um, monograph customers are entering timesheets daily in their browser to get real-time visuals on project performance. They are reducing their weekly staffing meetings by about 80%, and they're also forecasting future billings instantly there's no generating reports here. Reports just happen, right? It's all in integrated uh, magically. So they can run the right proactive business and make the right strategic decisions. You can try it out for yourself. Start a free trial today, 14, uh, 10 day trial at uh, monograph.com or come to the live demo tomorrow, uh, which Chris will add in the, in the comments, monograph.com backslash webinars backslash demo. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Really appreciate it. This has been a wonderful conversation with you both. Thank and Chris, as always, thank you. Thanks, sure. George. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, huge pleasure. Bye. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the attendees here, as always. Um, always a pleasure. And uh, 
you should, everybody should know that Seldorf is hiring. I saw at least three roles. There might be more. Um, so mm -hmm. come uh, apply to work with Sarah and Oliver. Sounds like a really great, great. place to work. Yeah, come along. Sounds awesome. Come along. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.